Hey guys, what's up? This is Ari Lauv. Uh, welcome to Breaking Modern Loneliness. Today I'm here with Dr. Vivek Murthy, and um, we're going to have a really, really amazing conversation. He's uh, done a lot of amazing work and continues to do a lot of amazing work, and yeah, I'm excited for his perspective. I'm curious, so like, what particularly like, has um, attracted you so much to the topic of loneliness? Well, Ari, I think... I think I was always sensitive to it because I struggled a lot with loneliness as a kid. You know, I remember, it's funny how these things stick with you. And I, I still to this day can feel what it felt like when my mom was driving up to school to drop me off when I was in elementary school. And I felt this like sort of sickening pit in my stomach because I was, I was scared. And I wasn't scared about teachers or exams. I was just scared about feeling left out all the time at school. And it was about being on the playground and not being a part of a team. It was about not being chosen to be a part of a group in class. But the worst part of the day, Ari, was uh, lunchtime when I would walk into the cafeteria and just would worry that there would be nobody to sit next to. And so it created a, a level of a stress and anxiety in my day as a child that I didn't, I didn't really fully know what it was all about. I didn't fully appreciate what was happening, but I knew that I just wanted to get out of there and I wanted to go back home when the bell rang at 3 p.m. So I think that sensitized me to the issue, made me more aware of loneliness. But then later in life, I started to see loneliness around me more clearly, like when I was practicing medicine. And you know, in medical school, I was taught about all the things you would imagine a doctor gets taught about, about how the body works, about how to fix things when it goes wrong. But what I didn't really learn about was, was loneliness and the fact that it was going to be so incredibly common among the patients who were coming into our hospital. And so I would see people, Ari, who would come in alone. And at really critical points when we had to talk about a really difficult diagnosis or when we had to you know, make a really tough decision on what treatment to give them, there was nobody there uh, to be with them to, uh, to have, be a part of that discussion. And so that really stuck with me. So all of that was in the back of my head. Uh, when I became Surgeon General. And even though I wasn't planning to focus on that issue, what happened is when I started my tenure and I was traveling the country meeting with people in living rooms and town halls and community centers and schools, uh, what I found is behind so many of the stories that I was hearing were these threads of loneliness where people would say things like, you know, I've got all these burdens and I feel like I have to carry them all by myself. Or I feel like if I disappeared tomorrow, nobody would even care or I feel absolutely invisible. And I was hearing this from college students. I was hearing this from farmers in the Midwest. I was hearing this from people who lived in fishing villages in Alaska. I was even hearing it from members of Congress in Washington, DC, who were all saying something really similar. So that's what, that's what clued me into the fact that there was something much deeper, deeper happening here that went beyond the personal experiences that I had or what I had seen in the hospital. But it made me realize that loneliness is really, really common. And do you think, like, the way you're describing it being so present in so many different people's lives is something that's kind of developed more so over time, you know, as, as like, I guess as civilization has evolved and, and as people's lives have become more and more complicated? And, or, like, how do you, like, what do you think about all of that? Well, you know, I, I think loneliness has been around for, for a long, long time, but I think there's a, a strain of it in modern living, which is particularly painful and acute. See, because for most of our existence as human beings, we really needed each other, right? So when we were like hunter gatherers, we needed each other to survive, right? To watch out for predators, share food supply, etc. But there's an illusion that we're sort of being told in the modern world, which is that we don't need anyone else because I can sit at home and order anything I want uh, online. I can stream any movie that I want. I can listen to whatever music I want. I, I don't need to go out anywhere, you know, or I don't really need anyone because I can do everything from, from my couch, right? So there's this illusion that we're self-sufficient. But the reality is that our, the way we function, our nervous system, our mind, our hearts, they're very similar to how we were thousands of years ago. We still actually really do need each other emotionally, even if for practical purposes, we can rely on technology to help us. I think there's another factor, though, in the modern world, Ari, that's, that's, that's really hurting us, which is, I think, how we use technology. Like tech can be super helpful, right? For efficiency, for all kinds of purposes. And, and even for human connection. Like I, when I was small, I had to write hand, like written letters to my 
uh, grandmother and grandfather in India, like in order to like, you know, get a letter to them. And it took two weeks for that to, to arrive at their doorstep and two weeks for a reply to come back. It was pretty tough to remain as connected as I wanted to be. Now, you know, we can FaceTime with relatives half a world away. It's, it's really easy. But the, the challenge, I think, Ari, with, with how we're using social media is I think it's, it's number one, it's edging out in-person connection because we're spending so much time with people online instead of offline. But even when we're with people in person, I think it's diluting the quality of our connection because it's always present. We're checking it all the time. We're thinking about what to post. But I think perhaps like the most like concerning piece about social media to me is how it erodes our sense of self and our self-esteem. Because what it does is it convinces us uh, over time that, uh, that number one, that our lives aren't good enough because we're comparing our average days to these curated pictures and experiences that people are posting on Instagram and on other platforms. But also like the messages that we're getting so often on social media and traditional media are that we're not enough, right? We're not good looking enough. We're not popular enough. We're not rich enough. We're not funny enough. And over time, you keep getting those messages. It chips away at your self-esteem. And, and when you start to doubt that you have worth and value to bring to the world, it makes it tougher to show up as your real self with other people. And that makes it harder to connect with them. That's a scary thing. And meanwhile, you're so caught up in your own thing trying to solve it that you have no room for other people. You have no room. Even if you want to connect with other people, you're so stressed out and so anxious and, and caught up in your own shit that you can't even like make room for your own, I found for even my own best friends sometimes. And you know, mm. for those meaningful connections where you really are present. So that's, that's hard. Gosh, I mean, that, that really resonates. And, you know, I listened to the, to the song Modern Loneliness uh, the, that you created. Beautiful song, by the way. Um, sort of touched me personally. And I was really struck by one line in particular where you said, um, I think it was, uh, like, I love my friends to death, but I, but I never call. Um, and, you know, that there was so much packed into that line, right, about how I think so often we, we have people we love, but we're not, we're not engaged in experiencing that love, right? Like, I remember at one point when I was really lonely after I, uh, finished my time in government and I was like really struggling with just sense of purpose, my identity, self-worth, a whole bunch of things. Um, I remember I talked to a friend and my friend said, Vivek, you have friendships. You're just not experiencing friendship. Oh, wow, that's and it was, it was, it was a really profound statement, but it, she was right. She was like, you know, a lot of times we have these extraordinary relationships in our life. Maybe it's our friends, maybe it's our parents, maybe it's a sibling. But we start to retreat further and further, like into our shell, the lonelier we get, which is ironic because that's a time where ideally we think we should be reaching out. But actually there's a reason like biologically why we do that. Uh, because like, you know, back in the day when we were in this, when we were separated from our tribes thousands of years ago, like we were under threat, right? And so when we are under threat, your body goes into, an, into a state of lockdown mode, right? Where your threat level is elevated, your attention shifts inward because you're worried about your safety. Uh, and you're on high alert, so you're hyper vigilant. You know, even if something's not a threat, you perceive it as a threat. And the thing is, even though our circumstances are different today, like our nervous systems are very similar. So when we're lonely, we go into that same uh, mode, that hyper vigilance mode, and we start to pull away from people just when we should be reaching out to them. And that deepens our loneliness. It's why I think loneliness is so, so tough to address. And we've got to find a way to break that cycle. But one of the, I think, amazing things that, that breaks that cycle can be like when, when a friend reaches out and takes initiative to, to check on you and invites themselves in. You know, I, I worry, Ari, that sometimes like we, I think sometimes we give people too much space like in their lives. Like sometimes we've got to not wait for somebody to ask for help or invite us in. But sometimes we've got to like go and knock on their door, even if there's a chance that we get rejected or the door isn't answered. Like we need to... I think sometimes do more to help people see that we that we still see them, that we know they matter, that we still care about them. But but that's I think one of the reasons why loneliness is is really tough. But I was struck by that line in your song because it it reminded me of that. And if you don't really understand like how painful loneliness is and it doesn't make sense, you're like, well, if you've got people you love, why aren't you calling them, right? Well, this is why. It's because it's like a, a really tough downward spiral. 
It's also like you have any number of people that you know that you can speak to at any moment. You can text or you can go on Instagram and, and message them or whatever. But I almost feel like there's, it's so overwhelming, these, these options and all these people we know. Then, you know, in addition, you have the layer of, oh, which of these relationships may be strategic to my career or like, you know, it, it, there's all these different, there's so much yeah. at play that it, I think it becomes overwhelming, especially for somebody who's anxious, you know, like I find myself as an anxious person, like I... I almost find myself like obsessively planning the right time of day that I should speak to somebody. Like I'm like, oh, right mm. now is not the perfect time for me. So even though I want to talk to them, I won't until later. But then of course later, I'm also not ready. And then it's like, I didn't mean to isolate myself, but you just do it anyways. Yeah, gosh, that it, it feels like we have so many options today in terms of what we could do that it almost is paralyzing uh, in a sense. And you know, as you were talking, I it made me wonder, like in your journey to like explore this, like your own feelings of loneliness and your own challenges with mental health. Like, if I asked you, like, where does your self worth come from? Like, how would you answer that question now? I'm working on it, but I think a big part of it does come from like outside approval. Um, yeah, I think that's been a big thing for me for a long time. Um, I don't know. I, it's like I always feel like. I don't really know where it started, but one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, I moved around a few times growing up and I always kind of like found my angle when I come to a new school. Like, oh, if I'm like kind of like the weird kid, like then people pay attention to me and like, all of a sudden I have this accelerated importance when I get to the school. Oh, he's a kid who makes these like weird impressions and noises. And, and uh, yeah, I would like kind of find my way in or, you know, even at the beginning, I feel like when I first started making music when I was a teenager and putting it up on the internet, I was always comparing myself to other artists that were similar to me and like, why don't I get as many plays? Why don't I have, on like MySpace, like why don't I have as many friends? Like why can't, no one want, why does no one want to come to my concerts? And then at a certain point, I let it eat away at me to the point where I was like, you know what, I won't even try to be an artist and I'll be behind the scenes. And then, you know, I kind of by chance in writing a certain song that was really personal, decided to step back into being an artist in 2015. But I'll be super honest, you know, there's been a big, kind of battle between, I guess, like my ego and just like my love for the process and my love for the, the craft that even still in a place where I've, you know, I'm really lucky and I have a lot of blessings in my life based on my success, I still find myself more stressed out and seeking more approval and higher numbers when I have like so many amazing friends around me. I have such a beautiful life. I have the opportunity. I'm one of the few people, you know, who gets to do what they love to do every single day. Yet I continue to like beat myself down because I'm not, if I don't get like to a higher level in my career or something. And I feel like so much of my self-worth is, is no matter how much I acknowledge it and I say it to myself is still tied to this outside, hmm. this, you know, these external factors. And that's not, I'm trying to figure out, you know, because I think that causes me to be more lonely because I'm placing importance in things that really aren't doing anything for my soul, you know? That early on, there are just a thousand signals around us that are telling us that our worth as a human being is tied to our ability to be successful and that our ability to be successful is driven by one of three things, whether we can acquire wealth, fame, or power, and ideally all three, right? And, and so I feel like when you look around at society, whether you look at the movies that are made, the books that are written, uh, the stories that are told in the news, like the people that are held up as models of success are people who've achieved one of those three things. But I feel like one of the things that that so that we learn through so many practices, whether it's meditation, whether it's sort of the heart of many religious traditions, whether it's through true friendships, we learn that our self worth is really intrinsic, right? It's it's based, I think, fundamentally on our ability to give and receive love. That's what makes us worthy as human beings. And relationships are powerful because they are the primary vehicle through which we give and receive love. Um, you know, there's this. Um, sometimes when I when I, you know, talk to students at graduation time, like due to commencements and stuff, there's this like very simple, like ten second exercise that I I do myself before I get into a room to give a, a talk, and that I sometimes try to do with them also to remind myself that regardless of what's going to happen over there, my my self worth is rooted in here. It's it's rooted inside and it's based on that ability to give and receive love. And if you want to do it with me, it's actually very quick and simple. Yeah, I would just, love to. So just close your eyes 
and take your hand and just put it over your heart. And take a deep breath. And for the next 10 seconds, just think about the people in your life who have loved you over the years, the people who have been there for you during really difficult times, the people who you've celebrated with during great moments, the people who stood by you and believed in you, even when you lost faith in yourself. And feel their love just washing over you, flowing through you, and filling you with peace. And know that that love will always be with you, no matter what happens in the world, because it resides in your heart. Now open your eyes. And what you felt there was that extraordinary power of love. And that's what makes us worthy as human beings. The fact that we can give that love and receive that love. And I think one of the hardest things in the world to do, Ari, especially in the modern age, is to hold on to that. That was just where I was going to go. I was just going to go with that. I'm like, why is it so hard to hold on to that? My brain immediately is like, when is this going to be interrupted? When is this going to be cut away from me? That's yeah. always, and I talk about this with my therapist, like this, like in, interrupting your own pleasure, interrupting, you know, your own happiness. Like, what is that? It's crazy. Well, part of what I think will help us keep it in our lives, Ari, is, um, is actually other people. You know, I've, I struggle with this all the time too. I, I have many times in my, in my days and in, in my life where I, I find myself slipping back into that old mode where I'm judging myself based on what someone else says or approval from the outside. Um, I mean, I'll give you, like, to be totally honest with you, I'll just give you this uh, a real-time example that's happening right now in my life. So I just wrote this book, right, on the power of social connection and the consequences of loneliness called Together. And, you know, I know that there are people who want me to, to get this book in the hands of everyone, who want me to, like, sell many copies of this book, to be on bestseller lists, to do all of these, like, things, right? And I found that, I was getting really anxious and feeling just really drained every time I would have these conversations. And I would look at these numbers and I'd be like, oh my, these numbers high enough? Are they okay? Like, where am I, et cetera. And at some point I was like, I'm judging my worth based on how many books are sold. I was like, I can't do that. I was like, why did I write this book in the first place? I was like, I wrote it because I wanted to do something that would help build a more connected world a more people-centered world for myself, for my children, and for all of us. I did this because I wanted us to know that our ability to give and receive love was not only at the center of what made us worthy, but it was, gonna, it was at the center of how we were going to heal this world and move forward uh, as a community, as a country, as a planet. That's why I wrote this book. So I had to like keep bringing myself back toward that, but I enlisted a few friends to help me. And I said, hey, I feel like I'm slipping away. I need you to remind me. You know, and, and I need us to talk, you know, about this. And I need just, I need your presence because this is like tough to do alone. And it was really, really helpful. Um, but I found that like, whether it's like trying to change your diet or trying to start a new gym routine or trying to remember what ultimately gives you worth and value in the world, that we need to do that in community actually with other people as well. Which is why I was actually really struck when you told me uh, earlier on about your meditation practice in a group because I think that it's so powerful to do these things together because we, we keep each other on the path. Yes. And, yeah. and that's, that, I think, is what friendship is all about. That, that's what, when I was in college, and having these, one of these late-night philosophical conversations with friends, I asked this friend, I said, what do you think a real friend is? And he said, a friend is somebody who reminds you of who you are even when you forget. And we all need those reminders. And that's, I think, why relationships are so powerful for our personal development. Yeah. Where do you think, like at what point in your life did you kind of make that realization that led you to you know, want to make this book and to really share that message? The inspiration uh, from people I met all across the country who helped me see that all of us are going through this. It just because we're lonely does not mean we're alone in our loneliness, that this is a common struggle. But also that we have the extraordinary ability 
to build more connection in our life through small actions that we take. It's not about necessarily like saying, okay, we're never going to use technology anymore. We're going to, you know, drop everything we're doing and move to be so that we're right next to our families. I mean, some people may do that and that might be work for them, but we don't have to full scale transform our lives overnight in order to start walking toward greater connection. But it's in simple decisions we make about spending, you know, five or 10 or 15 minutes each day talking to someone we love, even when we don't feel like it. That discipline, that connection can be a lifeline for us. It's in the decisions we make about quality of time as well. Even if we didn't spend a single minute more uh, with people in our life, if we just decided that when we're talking to someone we love, that we're gonna put away our devices and distractions and just give them the gift of our full attention, that itself can be powerful. And, and these acts of service, I found, that were so, so just on display in the people I met all around the world, like acts of service are one of the most powerful ways that we have to build bridges to others and to serve as an antidote to loneliness. Because when you understand this negative spiral that we go in when we're lonely, based on our evolutionary mechanisms, you'll understand why service is so powerful because it shifts the focus from us onto someone else in the context of a positive interaction. And it also reaffirms for us that we have value to bring to the world at a time where our self-esteem is often eroding as we're chronically lonely. So when we look around the world, Ari, and we look in, just even around in our own lives, we'll find that there are actually many opportunities to serve, whether that's checking on a friend who might be struggling or just having food delivered, let's say to, to a friend who might be just dealing, having a really hard time and is just you know not taking care of themselves and they need some help in doing that. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can serve and it turns out when we serve, when we prioritize people in terms of the quantity and quality of time that we give them, that those are small but powerful steps toward building stronger connection. Yeah. I mean, getting to a place of, of true happiness, getting to a place of living a truly connected life, this is a lifelong journey. And like we move forward and then we move back at times and, and we have to you know, contend with circumstances around us changing a lot. But a lot of this, I think, when we boil it down is about being more real with other people in our life, right? Like so many of us, myself included, walk around with masks on, right? Trying to be who we think we should be, who someone else expects us to be, trying to fill a role. But the truth is that it's when we can be ourselves that we feel really good. That's why you don't need a lot of friendships in order to feel really connected. It really is about quality over quantity, but the friends where we can just show up as ourselves, where we can be received without judgment, or we can just be honest. And like, those are the, the relationships that really heal, that make us feel, feel good. And, and I think if we translate that over to social media and how we interact in other platforms in the world, um, the question is, how can we be real in all those other dimensions as well, right? So when I think about social media, I'll tell you honestly, I've struggled with how to deal with social media in a healthy way because sometimes I will post things and I'll realize that the reason I posted it is because I was looking for a reaction or I was looking for people to like it or to comment on it or think it was insightful or whatever it might be. And and then I'm like stuck looking at like how many times was it liked, how many times was it commented on, how many times was it reposted and retweeted. And like it's just and then after a while I'm just like, why did I even do this? Like in the first place. You know, this just feels like so hollow and empty. And you know when it really struck me was there was one year where it was September eleventh and it was one of the it was the anniversary of uh, the terrible disaster of nine eleven. And and I was watching this this memorial tribute and it really moved me. And I actually wrote something, a reflection about it. And then I posted it on social media. And so it felt really good just to, to write that because it was coming from a place of love. But then in the hours that followed, I found myself, found myself just looking again and again and again to see how many times it was like liked and commented on. And I was like, it made, it made hollow, you know, like the whole experience and it just didn't, didn't really feel good. So there are times where I've had to actually just shelve social media entirely in my life for a few months and just take a break for, so I can just recenter myself. But now when I try to engage with social media, I'm trying to think, how can I post something that feels authentic and true to who I am and post it not because I'm looking for a reaction, but because there's something inside me that I want to actually share with the world and, and not because I'm looking for approval. And 
sometimes I'll go days and days without feeling like I can do that in a clean way, so I won't post anything. You know, and other, but every now and then I might feel inspired or moved by something, and then I'll just try to put that, you know, out. But but it, it's a it's a struggle, you know. And I think that even though it looks like when you look around you that most people have it all figured out and that they've got, you know, their brand on social media and they're cultivating it and it's authentic and this and that and everything, I think a lot of people struggle with this. We just don't talk about it enough. Totally, I totally relate, relate to what you're saying. You know, to the T of, of doing that exact same thing where it's like, then I start to wonder, oh, was my motive as pure as I thought it was, if I really care this much about what the reaction is? But then I think, you know what, I think I've trained myself to be addicted to that reaction. So regardless of whether or not this was a genuine thing, I'm still addicted to knowing how people react. And then, and then it's also complicated because then you have the times where you, you know deep down you did it for that reaction and it works. And you're like, oh, that felt so good, but just like a drug, you know, it's like, that's that's not healthy, you know. And then yeah, it, it becomes complicated. And I find myself posting things, and then if it doesn't get enough of a reaction, archiving them or deleting it. And and mm-hmm. and and yeah, it's it's funny. And then I mean, there's so much about social media. I imagine it also just inflates, you know, how important you think you are to the world. You know, like oh, what do I? Are people waiting for me to say something? And me, me, mm-hmm. and yeah, there's I think there's so endless. Yeah, endless reasons that, like, you know, loneliness can be so common today. That's why I think these boundaries that we draw, Ari, are so important. Like, creating some sacred space in our life when we can be without social media and without our inboxes, even if it's for a short period of time. Like that, I think that's re- increasingly important now. And I think, I mean, I love what you're doing with your meditation group for that reason. I mean, if that's time where you're together with people in person mm-hmm. normally or even virtually today, uh, that's that's really really valuable. Especially if you you're able to give each other your full attention and be be fully present. I think in, another reason it's so valuable for me or a couple is that like I find it for, as somebody who for whatever reason maybe it has to do with you know childhood reasons or I think probably other people out there can relate. I have so much love inside that I feel for so many people. Like I really mm-hmm. do. Like to the core but I'm afraid to express it oftentimes for whatever reason, I'm afraid to just vulnerably be like, I worry it's gonna be overwhelming or it's gonna be weird or whatever. Even to new people, I'll have an amazing conversation with somebody new and I know right off the bat that like deep down I wanna be like, I have so much love for you, like I love you, but it's such a, you know, it's like there's a weird thing about doing something like that. But I find when we sit down and we do this meditation that mm. I can close my eyes, get in that place, we sit there and then I can express way more openly my love for the people I'm in the room with or I'm on FaceTime with and we wake up, or so not wake up, we come out of it with tears in our eyes, you know? And it's like, that's wow. so special, those kind of moments. That's amazing. And what, what you just said there, I think, is so powerful when you said you feel you have so much love to give. I mean, that's, that's your strength. That's your superpower. You know, it's that love that you have to give. And my guess would be, Ari, is that when you express that toward other people, even if it feels a little weird or uncomfortable because you're not used to doing that, my guess is it's liberating for others who might feel like they have permission now to not just receive that love, but to express love to other people and to have it be less of a stigmatized thing. It is so strange to me, Ari, and, and so striking that as human beings, we are so clearly powered by love, right? You look at the extraordinary things that a parent would do for their child. That's what love does. Right, it, it causes people to sacrifice their own lives for another human being. It's what soldiers do for each other in the theater of war. Um, they're doing, making the sacrifices they make, not just because they love their country, but because they, they have a deep love and affection and bond with the, the soldier standing next to them. And so it, in our best moments, it's so clear that love is what powers us. Yet all of us, and myself included, have just grown up with norms and, and a culture that tells us that we should be squeamish about love and that somehow it's a sign of weakness. Um, but love is our greatest source of strength. And I think the sooner we recenter our lives around that, the sooner we destigmatize love, I think the, the more powerful we'll be, I think the more healing we'll receive. And, and that's where I think our real fulfillment comes from. It's from those, those moments. I mean, even just like the short exercise we did in terms of like, thinking about love I, I've done that now a number of times that every time I do it just for 10 seconds remembering the love that I received from parents and family and friends 
it fills me up. It makes me feel so good and it calms me and centers me uh, in a way that I feel like I really need in this fast paced world and that I think that a lot of us need. Yeah. It's funny because it sounds like, you know, it sounds like some, some hippie, some hippie type shit, <laughs> but it's like, and, and I, you know, I think when I was younger, I would kind of be like, oh, okay, okay. But then you don't realize until you're in that place where you really need it. And you're like, that's so true. Like love is really everything, you know, just the way you get it and, and give it as a kid and those patterns you build and the friendships you build and maintain and those relationships, you know, I think it's so important and you know and as you drift further and further away from it or if it's not you're not properly given it as a kid then it's really it can feel so foreign and you cannot understand you can feel so confused as to why you don't feel right when it's just something that you know you haven't maybe been as in touch with as you need as you need to be and yeah i definitely find the more i openly integrate love into my life the more fulfilled i feel and i think the less lonely mm -hmm. i feel yeah mm -hmm. How does your family feel about your journey, Ari? I I guess we've never really had a conversation about it. You know, I, um, you know, my mom and one of my sisters are a part of my board for my foundation. Um, you know, which is more so just focused on mental health, but obviously love is ties into that greatly. And you know, I'll have certain moments. You know, that I'll do certain things, um, like when we did this panel, that you know, I'll get like a really loving reaction. Or when I made the music video for for Modern Loneliness, and um, which was all you know on the iPhone, and just a very much like a transparent look at the way I use my phone, and and you know there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like ignoring calls from my parents, but at the very end, you know, we get on Facetime, and it's this moment where it's like tears to your eyes, and you know, they'll, they'll my dad will express like that I, I cried like through and through watching that video, and it's like those little moments oh. where I think when they mm -hmm. open up to me, and I feel like I can be super open, like I feel like for whatever reason. And this may be a little bit off topic, and I've said this in an interview, and I don't even know if this interview has been released, but that it's like easier for me to express even my own desire to feel closer to people in my life. Like let's say, like you know, parents or a parent in a public setting that's not directly to them than it is to say it to them. But it's like the thing you really need is is it with them. You know, it's not mm. out there; it's right here. You know, but it's yeah, it's like it's that's an interesting place too. That's an interesting place. I'm sure they're really proud of you, what you're doing. Because it takes courage, I think, to talk about your own story, to talk about love, to go through a transformation and, you know, really public transformation, that too. That's, that's not, these aren't easy things to do, but um, I suspect that even when you, in public settings, express your love and appreciation for your parents and for your siblings, my guess is it still means a lot to them. You know, even if you want to say it privately and in person, my guess is they hear that message. Um, you know, I, I too have, have found that even though I say I love you to my parents a lot, that some of the deeper reflections on just how, how much I truly appreciate them and I'm grateful for them, I, I don't often express that in words, you know, in spoken words. I, I'll write a letter or I'll, I've included in my book so many tributes to my parents, uh, including the final tribute uh, and reflection in the book. But, but I find that I, it's easier sometimes, yeah, to, to do that than to, than to tell them face to face. But, you know, we're all working toward that. And I think, <laughs> you know, being able to be as open as we want to be uh, with the people that we love. But, um, but gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they're, that they're proud of what you're doing, and not just in your own life, but about the the impact that you're having on on other people and helping others open up, recognize the power of human connection, recognize the power of love. It's everything. Earlier, it's my favorite thing in life. It's making music mm -hmm. and having powerful conversations. Like I don't know what else could spend <laughs> all day every day doing that. And yeah, well. There's literally a billion other questions I can ask you, I mean, with everything that you've done and you continue to do, but thank you so much for spending this time with me and for answering these questions and for offering such a different perspective and you know, also for being so open. I really, really appreciate it a lot. No problem, Ari. It was really wonderful to have this conversation. I, time just flew by and it was just, thank you for being so open. And uh, it, was, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience to, to be with you today.